All right, well, good afternoon for the afternoon session of our Doctrine of God and His Word conference. Uh, our session in here, uh, in this breakout session this afternoon, has to do with the providence of God. Um, let, let me just give you a, a touch of background real quick before, before we get going. And uh, uh, there's... Uh, as, as we consider this, we're going to look uh, at, at three ideas that you, you may not just be able to go and readily point your finger at the words that, of what we're talking about in Scripture. However, it saturates Scripture. So uh, the, in the material that was put together very, very adeptly by uh, James Gibbons, uh, he gave us those titles. And uh, so I, don't, I won't want to confuse you. We're going to actually look at three of them. But let's begin by talking about some overarching questions that we might consider with regard to the providence of God. First off, what is the extent of God's control over creation? Now, in our group session before we came in here, uh, you heard a little bit that, that dealt with that, and we'll, we'll try to take it just a, a touch further. Uh, but one of the things that occurred to me as I was you know, putting my material together, uh, as we think about what is the extent of God's control over creation, what about all the evil that we see? I mean, we're inundated with it. And frankly, this is not a new development you know, evil's been, you know, alive and well, unfortunately, ever since the Garden of Eden. So as, as we think about the extent of God's control, if we're going to be honest and we're going to be complete, we need to also think about, you know, why is it that there are things going on in this world that you and I would choose to be other? We like to see it some uh, greatly different. The second thing is if God controls all things, I believe he does, how can our actions have any real meaning? In other words, if God is so in control and he has this exact plan for, for my life, I believe he does, how is it that we're anything but puppets? And as we attempt to answer that and understand uh, the three, three different ideas that we're just about to get into, um, we have to ask ourselves, what about free will? God's the one that gave us free will. We, we, we didn't conjure it up. Or we didn't devise it. So just as much as he is in control, he gives us free will and the ability to make choices. Um, ever since the early church started and, and history of the, the church was recorded, and actually you could take this even further back to the Old Testament, but for, for this example, let's just think about church history. These kinds of questions have led to lots of debate. If you look at the history of church meetings, you know, uh, James in our general session mentioned that one of his biblical heroes was a man by the name of Athanasia. Coincidentally, I've studied about Athanasia. Uh, just because he interested me. And uh, yeah, he was a leader. He brought a lot of good questions to bear to Jerusalem and to Rome and to all the centers where the church, early church decisions were being, making, being made. But what's interesting, Athanasia was a very small black man from North Africa. And you think, well, now, wait a minute. What's that got to do with free will? Well, free will says he recognized God as in control, but he also knew he had the choice to align himself with God's will and make decisions that way. I'm sure he made some bum decisions. He's human just like you and I. But nonetheless, uh, he's an interesting character when you think about free will and you think about early church leadership and early church debate. Uh, because it, it, it was rampant, and it just got worse on up through the Middle Ages. Well, 
One of the things uh, that, uh, as this material was put together by uh, uh, James and, and Brother Sam, they bring up a number of uh, kind of questions, thoughts along the way that uh, is interesting. I, th I think you're going to see as we move on, and I'm going to start trying to move a little faster here because we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, as we look at these things, you're going to see arguable points. Uh, you know, the, the session I was involved in this morning on the inerrancy of Scripture, personally, I don't think there was a, a, a big room for debate with much of what we talked about. I mean, a lot of room for consideration and understanding, but this, there's room, and that's good because we're going to be looking at some questions uh, been around since the early church uh, got started, uh, theologians, uh, from uh, theologians to new believers, people have had to deal with moral choices. Moral choices by moral characters. In other words, you and I, human beings, making a choice about how we live our lives, how we understand our life. Okay? The three elements of God's providence that we've been asked to look into this, and let, let me say, oh, this is some pretty comprehensive stuff. This is not everything that we could be considering, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they are preservation, concurrence, and government. Now, government is a word you'll find. The government will be upon his shoulders. Remember the, the uh, prophecy about the uh, uh, coming of, of Messiah. But just ask yourself, how much have you heard about the word preservation or about the word concurrence? You've probably heard something about government. However, I will tell you, these concepts are throughout the Bible. You find them conceptually and for us to deal with. And that's, that's our task, to learn a, a little more about God's providence within these three ideas. Well, there is a distinction made between general providence and special providence. General providence, God's general providence, refers to his upholding the natural order of the universe. Um, then there is special providence, and that refers to God's extraordinary intervention in the life of people. Right off the bat, I'm going to say you can insert the Lord Jesus Christ and the bringing of redemption. The whole redemption story could fit there. And then you could extend it to the everyday little choices uh, that, that you make. Um, preservation simply says God keeps all created things existing. He maintains their properties, which he created. Okay, He upholds all creation with an active and purposeful control. Now, you, this is, I think, Nehemiah chapter 6, and I've inserted some scriptures that I think will help us stay on track and, and put everything in a good perspective. Nehemiah uh, uh, chapter 9 and verse 6 says, You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts. Let me insert the word angels as a real possibility. The earth and everything that is on it, the seas, everything that is in them, you give life to all of them and the heavenly hosts, that's why I said angels, the heavenly hosts bow down before you. Nehemiah was probably a really intelligent and sharp person in his day. He, he, was, he was charged with, you know, with rebuilding and, and the, the restoration of Jerusalem, if you will, uh, after the uh, uh, exile. Uh, and it was a difficult, difficult job. But he understood God's providence. He was God's man to lead in the charge. So I think we, by example, we can take what we can learn about Nehemiah and see a very, very good example of God's uh, uh, perseverance and God's using someone to accomplish uh, 
the holding together of what he'd created. This would be the special providence because it's in the life of an individual more than it would be the general providence. Another scripture from the New Testament that I think is perhaps in some ways easier for us to wrap our arms around. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all fullness to dwell in him. That almost bridges the gap of general and special uh, providence, you might say. First Timothy chapter 4 simply says, Until I come, give your attention to the public reading, to exhortation and teaching. You might say, well, now, why, why did you put that scripture in there? Because it is through the public exhortation and through teaching that we get the big picture as well as what we need as an individual to make a decision to accept Christ as, as our Lord. But we get a big picture from that. Hebrews 1 and verse 3. He is the radiance of his glory and exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. We could spend more than the amount of time that we have left on that one verse. I mean, just quickly. He is the radiance of his glory. So you've got the Father, you've got the Son, and the exact representation of his nature. His nature is revealed in his will and upholds all things by the word of his power. Where do you find all this information? In his word. In his word. The second word that we want to look at, and it's a concept as much as the use of a particular word, is concurrence. Concurrence says, God, listen to this, because this is my challenge with this. God cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinct properties to act as they do. What this is really saying, what the idea is saying is God's in control and what we see going on is part of his plan. And I like to think in terms of concurrence this way, and I'll, I'll read some more in just a minute about it. If you see two paths walking down the same road, same, you've got a path on this side and you've got a path right here. And you're headed in the same direction. You be on one side, God's on the other. He's got his hand out, lead. That's just the way I like to look at it. Concurrence sometimes is grouped with the concept back of preservation like we talk. In other words, consisting and holding and together. But it is different because it means very much that it's two or more doing life together, one of them being God, and we pray and hope the other is you and other believers. God works to bring about all things according to his own will. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Back when we first started, I said something in effect of, what about evil? How do we understand evil in all this? God's got a plan, we're marching together, we're all headed in the same direction. What about evil? Just know, and we're going to talk to you a little more about it, but just know, yeah, evil's out there. The Bible tells us the story of the fall from the garden, and then it, you, you see it thereafter. Uh, it's true. But let me put it this way, not very theological sounding. Who wins? We do. Those that belong to God, we win because he's won the battle. Okay. Now, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, God, who works all things after the counsel of his will. 
That is Ephesians 1.11 again. Um, now, let's move on just a touch. I'm going to talk about concurrence because I don't want to get too bogged down in several areas. Okay, There's, let's talk about concurrence and creation. And, and this, this, this comes from Psalms 104. And verse 14 says, He, being God, causes the grass to grow for cattle and vegetation for the labor of mankind so that they may produce food from the earth. In other words, what's going on in the natural order? God initiated it. And not only, he didn't just set it in motion and walk away. He's involved. He's actively involved. And we are headed somewhere. And that somewhere is the fulfillment of his will for his creation. Okay? And we need to be careful that we, you know, we are very goal-oriented oriented people. We, we, we tend to, we've been told countless times, you got to have goals and you got to reach them. And in the right context and with the right perspective, I don't disagree with that. However, our goals need to be carefully aligned with God's will. And there is a difference. There is a difference. What about animals? What about animals? I know for a fact this guy's got or has had lots of animals. <laughs> and I just don't know you, sir, as well. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> right. Well, let's look at it this way. What does Scripture tell us? Because that's what really matters. Look at the birds of the sky that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns. Yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? God created it. Now, I have been accused of being a tree hugger. I have been accused of being an animal hugger. And I'll say, to some degree, guilty of all. I am. God created them. And he's in charge. It's when we abuse them that we see problems come about. Okay. What about concurrence? I, I, this is so important here. This is one that, that you know that we really need to give some, some, some thought and prayer to. Let the Lord speak to us. And that is concurrence in seemingly random or chance events. Our leader uh, has a, I, I, a scripture that is the best example. Of this that I could I could possibly think of. The lot, in other words, think for our purposes, let's say roll the dice in the old days, and these days it might even have been rolling literally bones uh, or something like that. Nonetheless, the lot is cast into the lap. Okay? Random chance. Here it is. It's been the dice have been rolled. But it is every decision, but it's every decision is from the Lord. How does that speak to you? How, how do you interpret that? How do you apply that with in your own life? How do you apply it with those that you love, those that you care for? How does it apply to the body of Christ? I had an old sociology teacher one time say, and he was, he was explaining that time of life, you know, when, when the kid goes from, uh, he's a tweener, you know, 12 years old, about to be 13, on up to, uh, through his teens, he says, that's a time of life when a kid gets on his horse and rides off in about six direction bolts simultaneously. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's trying all kinds of things. The thing that this is telling us is it is not random. It is not really chance. God has a plan in it. That he is in control. It's our job to get on board and so embrace our relationship with the Lord that we can see what he has for us to understand that brings him honor and glory. Okay. What about the affairs of nations? I, I thought so much about this one as I was making preparations with all the things that are going on uh, around the world, but especially with Russia and the Ukraine, and there's no end, real end in sight with that. Uh, at the moment, the concurrence in the affairs of nations. Well, let's see what Scripture says. 
Men, why are you doing these things? This is Acts 14, uh, verses 15, 17. Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, preaching the gospel to you to turn from these useless things to a living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. In past generations, he permitted all nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. I do not pretend to tell you I understand the breadth and the depth of that scripture, but I can tell you this. In the affairs of nations, no matter what's on the mind of men, you know, like we starts off, why are you doing these things? We might say, Mr. Putin, why are you doing this? I, you know, over, over there. Or anywhere else in the world, uh, really, right now, you could practically say that. Why are you doing these things? God has a plan. We are in and through it. There will be honor and glory come to God. Here is a minor example. It's not going to be the end story in Ukraine, but it's a good one right now. With what's going on in the Ukraine right now, can Northside Baptist Church do anything that is really helpful? And the answer is we already have. We already have. We are supporting our own members who are over there with the deaf bridge ministry. When Chris is over there leading that, you know somebody's getting hearing something about Jesus. You know that is happening. Is that the biggest thing going on over there? No, but it's an important thing going on over there. Very important. So, you know, God is a fair is involved in the affairs of nations. One other quick example from the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian. Arch the Jews uh, to Babylon. You know, big damage in Jerusalem. He goes over there and he starts picking some of the very best, uh, at least in his mind, of, of, of the Jews to, to, to serve him. As time goes on, by the end of that, and I'm not t going to tell you that he became a man of God, but I'm going to tell you that he did uh, God did use Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he went nuts for a while. Sent him out into the desert. But when he came back, what I read in Scripture, I see a picture of a man that's encountered God and been restored. You know, and you could even go on to say the same thing about Cyrus, you know, who took him down. You know. So, uh, just know, no matter how bad it is, God is involved in the affairs of nations. And I'll even go so far as to say much of what we're seeing on, he already prophesied, he already told us it was coming. And what we're seeing is it is history culminating. At least a very, very good chance of it. Okay, and then he talks about concurrence in all aspects of our lives. For in him we live and move and exist as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his descendants. That's Acts 17, 28. There is not one area of your life that God is not concurrently aware of, involved in, and wants something and expects something of us to his honor and to his glory, not ours, okay? Does free will have a place in concurrence? Remember I mentioned that originally. Well, first off, let's define free will, and James gave us this definition, and it's good. It's kind of a mouthful, so listen. Free will is first a holy, unrestrained spirit, liberated from any ceremonial liability or obligation. Underscore obligation. It is choice centered in the certainty of freedom. For the believer, free will is a decision of faith made without compulsion, and it's best described in Scripture.
I've heard some attempts of describing what free will is in a secular sense, and they were they fell short. <laughs> Let's just say that they fell short. Uh, so, I, I, I've used this scripture more than once. I used it this morning too in the first session. This verse that's practically a standard for evangelicals. Well, it is a standard for evangelicals. Applies in so many ways. It is broad. It is deep. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now notice something about that. It is everyone who believes is that not a strong implication of what free will is? You have the opportunity to make that choice. Believers have made that choice, okay? Then it goes on. Oh, yeah. It says, and it will come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Where'd that come from? That's Old Testament. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. As it goes on, it says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the same scripture, but taken out of Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. And notice again, both cases, old, new. And I don't really make a big distinction. I believe it's a continuous thing. But nonetheless, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, free will. Okay? Free will is a whole lot more than saying just yes or no to uh, something going on. It is a deep and abiding decision with eternal consequences and eternal implications. All right, the third one, the third area. I'm going to have to move a little faster. Government says, and this is about government, government's role. God has a purpose in all he does in the world. He providentially governs or directs all things in order that they accomplish his purposes. Now, I'm not going to read you the scriptures, but in your notes there, um, you'll see references, Psalms 103, Daniel uh, chapter 4, Romans 8, and again in 11. Those are worth praying over, meditating over, and just thinking about. Believers have to remember that God works through human actions as part of his providential management of the world. We are not puppets. You know, this is not a play that he's already written the script out. He may know the end of it, but we, you know, we, we only know about the end of it as he has revealed things to us. The believer's actions are important and we are responsible for our actions. Thus, how government figures in. Government in Washington, D.C., government in Beijing, China government in Moscow or anywhere else, yes. But I really think what we're talking about is the government of God worldwide. You can't separate it. That's back to concurrence. Two, two paths together. Our actions have real results, and they do change the course of events. Prayer is a specific kind of action that has definite results and does change the course of events. John 16, uh, 23 through 24, and James chapter 4 and verse 2. We learn a lot about the purpose and effectiveness of prayer. And I suspect in this group I don't need to beat that to death, but I want to emphasize it. I want to emphasize it. The entirety, and this is, I think, my favorite. Uh, the, it's called the High Priestly Prayer in John uh, uh, chapter 17. It reveals Jesus and what he had to say about prayer in three ways. Number one, it, it reveals Jesus' very heart concerning prayer with his heavenly Father. In other words, his prayer with the Heavenly Father, okay? That was specific, that was unique to him. He's given it to us that we know what happened, but we don't know exactly what he said, everything that he said. His prayer for the disciples is the second 
In other words, he prayed steadfastly for the disciples who would become 11 of the 12 apostles and then later Paul joins them. He prayed specifically for them. And then he goes on. And guess what? He prayed for you, 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 me, everybody. Where he went on to pray for all who would believe in him as a result of the disciples' ministry. Okay, so it's it's not uh, it's not a mistake to be thankful for the ministry of the Apostle Paul, of the Apostle Peter, James, John, or any any of, of those. We we need to be thankful, and prayer is the active, the dynamic. We must act and we must pray. In the church, we need action, godly led action, and we need prayer, much prayer. Providence in no way encourages us, us to sit back in idleness. Some say, well, if God's got a plan out there, I guess I'm just sitting back watching it along for the ride. That is not true. That can never be true for the believer. Here's a few biblical thoughts as we're kind of beginning to wind down about God's providence. First, we need to recognize God's ways are not our ways. When we have trouble understanding how this ugly thing here, this evil thing here, this deadly thing there, how could that possibly have happened in a world that God created? I would remind you what of Isaiah Chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Hmm. Well, let's look a little bit further. Let, let, let's look to uh, another part of God's word, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent. To present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. This is out. That was out of the uh, NASB, but the King James version says it. I think great. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you remember in our group session, James talked about the dividing power. So, uh, you know, study. It's real simple. Study. Rely upon God's Holy Spirit. So, and I like this. I, I, this is an example. Uh, a little bit I'm taking it out of context, but it's valid, 100% valid. This is from Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you in that hour. How? By the Holy Spirit. That's serious business. That has already happened, and it's going to happen some more. Okay? God's love is demonstrated both in creation as well as in the sustaining acts of what was created. Now, notice, I said it's his love. I didn't talk about some kind of big show of force and power and what that truly love is the dynamic sustaining power. God's Son Jesus is that dynamic that providence providentially holds the created together. That's Colossians chapter one verse seventeen. And you know, I mean, just on a side note. If you're like me, I kind of enjoy watching the History Channel, the Science Channel, and, and some of those things. Yet how often are there entire hour-long shows devoted to explaining what science knows about something and never once, never once mention the author, the perfecter, and the creator that was behind all of it to begin with? That's, that's sad. So it's up to us to tell that story. The greatest declaration of his providence, and you heard me use it differently a minute ago, but it comes right back to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
I added it up there for, I guess, a couple of reasons, but one in particular, but have eternal life. As we concurrently go down through the word, as we concurrently go down through life, as we concurrently go down through everything that comes our way, we're headed somewhere. And that somewhere is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The providence of God can be seen anywhere through the eyes of Christ followers. A bit of a mouthful, but what it boils down to say is we're going to see followers, when I say we, followers of Christ, believers in Christ, born again, new creations in Christ Jesus. We're flat going to see things differently than the lost. How do we collaborate with divine providence? Consider providence as God's caring provision as he guides them in their journey of faith through life, accomplishing his purpose. And it's important we realize our thoughts are not the same as his. In other words, we're not going to understand everything that there is about God except what he's fully revealed to us. But it's for his purposes. We need to get on board with his purposes. He doesn't need to get on board with our purposes. Recognize it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. With the pride that we all time to time suffer from, that might be a little hard. But as you pray and dwell upon that scripture, which is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, I think God will illuminate your thoughts. I really believe that. Non-Christians may confess everything as a purpose, but the truth of the matter is they leave it in the hands of chance, blind, impersonal fate, if you will. Christians see God's providence revealed in all things, knowing God has designed history to achieve a particular end, and he directs history as well as individual lives so that his divine will is accomplished. And as far as you and I go, the number one part of his divine will for us is that we be saved, that we be saved. We believe and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. It's true that we have difficulty sometimes comprehending God's involvement in the events of life, but the reality is Christian concurrence helps us realize God and humans both act with purpose at the same time. Our job is to embrace his will. Christians do well when they seek to understand God's will in every area of life. And it's not a lack of faith that causes uncertainty and confusion. Genuine faith leads us to conclude God is at work in history. It, a genuine faith enables you to see it differently. I direct you in the presence of God who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without fault or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings, lords of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Amen. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6. I think I've run two minutes over, so I'm sorry. But I hope this gives you, in particular if you'll take those with you, something to think about because I think the, the prayers, the meditations, and just the consideration or sitting down visiting with fellow believers will enrich you and help you understand God is truly in control. And we're all headed, as believers, we're all headed in the same direction. So, thank you.